Hi everyone, uh, welcome back. Today we're going to carry on talking about alkanes. Um, in the past or so far, we've only covered um, straight chain alkanes, so anything that has a single carbon-carbon bond, just a very long chain. Um, in the extreme case, like we saw uh, here with uh, polyethylene, it can just be a an extremely long, including um, thousands of uh, thousands of carbons. Uh, just in a long chain of single single bonds. Um, today we're going to carry on with branching chains. There's really no requirement that one carbon is only bonded to one other carbon. Uh, it can have side chains coming off of it. So these will be any carbon-carbon uh, chains that are not as long as the parent chain or the very longest uh, stretch you can make of just single carbon-carbon-carbon bonds. Um, this is going to be the parent chain. Anything shorter than that gets called a side chain that comes off of the main uh, carbon backbone. Uh, okay, so these get named the same way as an alkane. Uh, we just changed the suffix from an A-N-E to a Y-L. Okay, so uh, if you were looking at, say, a chain, okay, this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, so this would be a heptane, uh, and it has a side chain of uh, one uh, carbon bond, and this is of course saturated itself, then this would be a methyl group. So meth staying the same, and now it just includes a YL for the methyl group. Uh, ethyl would do something similar. So again, we'll just do a, a heptane, and now we have one, two coming off of it. This would be now an ethyl group. Uh, propyl would be the same thing, just with a third link. So we have one, two, three carbons for a uh, propyl group. Uh, isopropyl. Now you would have heard that maybe thinking about isopropyl alcohol. The iso in front of the propyl means that instead of the um, carbons all being linked in a line, we have one carbon bond coming off of the main parent chain and then the other two are both linked to it. So this would be one, two, three carbons still. But now, uh, if you like, we've just taken uh, the very same, oh, let's try this pen. We've taken the same uh, group and just rotated it slightly so that we now have uh, same using the same numbers as we have there, one, two, and three carbons. It's just attached to the second carbon instead of the first. Okay. Um, a butyl group is going to be the same kind of idea. So one, two, three, four. Uh, and isobutyl will do, I hope, what you expect now and to say one, okay, we'll do our parent chain. Uh, one carbon coming off. And then the other three carbons, or all four, are really going to be attached by uh, the second carbon in the chain. So one, two, three, four. Um, for isopentyl or things, then it's going to it's going to depend on whether it attaches to the third or the the second carbon. Um, but if you were to look at this butyl group uh, and rotate it so that instead of this being the second carbon uh, this one would be the second carbon. You'll see that it looks exactly the same. We could flip it upside down uh, and then rotate it around and you would end up with exactly the same picture. So there's really no, no difference uh, based on which carbon we bonded to there. With larger chains, then it's going to start to make a difference. Uh, okay, so that's the idea for side chains. And um, but at the same time, just listing the number of carbons and the number of hydrogens doesn't really give us uh, an exact picture of what we're going to uh, produce. Um, and I think by now we'll, we'll have seen that uh, what a chemical does or how it reacts with other molecules depends on the shape of it. So uh, a geometrically changed arrangement of the same atoms is going to have differences in um, differences in behavior. So this is what we would call a geometric isomer. So isomers 
uh, have the same atoms, the same molecular formula, um, but have them assembled differently. So uh, if we were going to draw an alkane molecule with the formula C4H10, uh, so this is a butane, so we go one uh, carbon, bonded to another carbon, bonded to another carbon, bonded to another carbon. And there are hydrogens all over this thing. Uh, two, one, two. Oof. And one, two, three to cap it off. Okay, so that's our four uh, carbons and 10 hydrogens, or just to simplify it, we'll just do one, two, three, four. Uh, but we could also draw this, one, two, three, four, right? So we'd have a carbon in the center. Uh, actually, let's draw it out explicitly with all the hydrogens just so that we can really see it. So we'll have a carbon with a hydrogen on it. And then we're going to bond that carbon to three other carbons. So it has its four bonds and each one of those is filled with hydrogens so that it has each of its uh, four bonds. So that's uh, three, six, nine hydrogens on the methyl group, one in the center. So we still have four carbons and 10 hydrogens, but obviously these aren't the same, uh, same arrangement. So these are going to have different boiling points. They're going to have different chemical reactivities, um, but the same molar mass, the same uh, chemical formula. Okay. So we can't just really say, um, C4H10. We have to have a different way of naming these things so that we can really understand exactly what their geometric layout is. So that's when we get into these naming rules um, that seem a little bit outdated or eclectic or um, obscure. And especially when we're reading the back of a shampoo bottle and it's got these, uh, you know, 25 syllable words that nobody can decipher. This is where it's coming from. From a, from a trained chemist's perspective, you can look at those words on the back of the shampoo bottle and understand exactly what molecule it is they're talking about, which of course is important. So in order to name the, the carbon compounds, the first thing we're going to do is to look for the longest chain, continuous chain of carbons. So that's, that's the parent compound and that's the one that we're going to use as the, um, we're gonna define it as a heptane or an octane or a nonane. It gets the, the main uh, root word, okay? Uh, alkyl groups attached to the chain have their names used as the attachment. Uh, so if we had an octane, so this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, maybe we have, uh, two carbon chains coming off there somewhere in the middle. So this would now be a ethyl octane. Um, but where is that ethyl group? How are we going to define if it's there and not coming off of there or there or any other point along this octane molecule? So that's when we, uh, where the number of the carbon atoms comes in. So we're going to number all of the carbons along the parent chain so that any side groups or anything else we want to define has the lowest possible number. So in this case, if we numbered these uh, octane carbons as one, uh, so left to right, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, so this would be a five ethyl octane. Uh, however, if we number them from the opposite direction, so now right to left, we go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It's no more or less an octane, uh, but now that makes our side chain on the uh, fourth carbon. So this would be a four ethyl octane. Since that's a lower number than five, that's the preferred way of naming it. Okay, so when more than one alkyl group of the same type is attached, we use the, the Greek prefixes against, di, tri, tetra, penta, to say how many there are attached. So if we take our same octane, now that we've numbered it, um, 
and we put another ethyl group on there, for example. Um, so now this would be a, I'll erase that, and this will be a diethyl octane. And we still want to have the lowest numbers overall. So now we might have to change the order of the numbers again. So that we have a, this would be a one, two, three, four, five. So this would be a two, five diethyl. So again, we want to identify where those two are showing up um, and also how many there are. Uh, that part seems a little bit redundant, but that's, that's the standard. Um, if, for example, oops, if, for example, we had even another uh, ethyl group on there at the same point, so now this would be a 2-5-5-triethyl uh, octane. Um, and, of course, we can also add on, we'll use the sparkly one again this time, we can add on other groups as well. So this is getting a little bit much, but let's say we had those two methyl groups on there. Um, now most of the groups are going to be located towards the right, so we'll change the numbering again, uh, so that we have, uh, okay. And let's just go on to step five to say when several types of alkyl groups are present, uh, as they are now, so now we have two methyl groups as well as three ethyl groups. We list them alphabetically. So not that the uh, the number of carbons, but the just the uh, letter that the uh, side group starts with. Um, so ethyl starts uh, earlier, so that's going to be the first one that comes up, and then methyl will come after that. So if we were going to write this now, uh, it would look like uh, let's, I think we're going to have to renumber it again. So this is going to be a four and a five, six, seven. Okay. So we're going to have a four, uh, four, four, seven, triethyl, uh, two, three, dimethyl, octane. And you can see how quickly these words grow in length, but um, if we used any fewer points of it, we would have a less clear idea of what molecule we're talking about. And honestly, that is the most important part of all of this, uh, is just clarity in communications. Uh, okay, and then finally, when a halogen is present in place of a of a hydrogen, we can use the prefix chloro, bromo, iodo, fluoro, uh, anywhere to identify its location. Okay. Um, so let's try this example. Uh, hopefully, it's it's legible on your screen. Uh, take a moment just to to try to figure out exactly what it is, and I'm going to, of course, just write down the the answer in a moment. So if you need a moment, just pause here. Uh, and just hit play now, okay. Uh, so this, if we're going to look it out, first thing we wanna do is to look at the longest chain, uh, continuous chain of carbon atoms. So here I think it's, we've made it kind of easy. So it's going to be uh, the chain along the top. Hmm. No, get out of here. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, so this is a heptane. Wow. Um, and there are two side chains. So we have a side chain right here. So that is a methyl group. And we have one right here. So three carbons bonded on the center carbon. So that is an isopropyl group. Okay, so overall, we want to keep these numbered to the lowest possible. So we'll number it one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, and so our methyl group comes off of number two and our isopropyl off of number four. 
And so we name this for isopropyl 2-methyl. And I don't have enough space there, but we'll just erase that. 2-methyl heptane. OK. And that's really all there is to it. Uh, you'll notice that the isopropyl uh, has the lowest uh, beginning to its name. So the iso is, uh, it counts, okay? So we wouldn't go 2-methyl or isopropyl just because the propyl part comes after M or P comes after M. Um, so we're going to use the isopropyl as part of the name. However, the numbering, so if we had di or tri, et cetera, that, that's excluded, okay? Um, this will become uh, a little bit more, uh, you'll become used to it as you try it more often. Uh, okay, so here we have another example of just an alkane. Uh, again, give this one a try uh, by yourself. Identify the longest parent chain. So this would be one, two, three, four, uh, butane. Uh, and uh, I think we've numbered it correctly because those two side methyl chains are both on the lowest number. They could, we, if we had numbered it the other way, they'd be on number three. We want them to be on the lowest number, so number two is good. Uh, so this would be 2, 2, dimethyl uh, butane. Okay, and if we replaced that, for example, um, we can leave our number in, just get rid of the dots, 2. Uh, if we said these were actually not methyl groups, but let's replace that with a chlorine, uh, and this can be a fluorine. Uh, so now this would be a 2-chloro, 2-fluoro, butane. And it works just like that. Okay, so now we have some more examples on the sheet. Um, Again, if you've got the sheet in front of you, here's a good time to just stop, try them yourself, uh, and we will, uh, and then resume the video just so we can go over it, but I'll, I'll carry on. Uh, so for isopropyl heptane, that's uh, quite a lot like we've already seen. So if we're drawing it from the name first, uh, first what you wanna do is look to see, okay, uh, it's got an A and E on the suffix, so that means it's going to be an alkane. We know that it's just going to be fully saturated carbons. Uh, and we've got seven of them on the parent chain. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, and now side groups, there is an isopropyl group and it's going to be on the fourth carbon. So it's a heptane, so it doesn't really matter which side we start counting from, four is just going to be in the middle. So we'll go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and draw in an isopropyl group. Okay, so that is the, the complete molecular structure. Uh, the second one is a little bit more complicated. So we have a 3,4-diethyl-3-methylhexane. Uh, however, the method that you're going to go doesn't change at all. So really, it's no more or less complicated than any other structure you might want to draw from its name. So we're still going to look to say, okay, it's, a, it's an alkane, it has the A-N-E suffix. There are six carbons on the longest stretch. Um, and just to the point, we don't have to do a zigzaggy uh, line to start it off. We can do something like one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, that's still fine, okay? Uh, it's really going to depend on the size of the page that you have uh, and some other considerations. Okay, so now let's start adding the side groups. So uh, it doesn't really matter which one you begin with at this point because, um, again, these are just written alphabetically. It doesn't have anything structural about it. So, uh, but we can keep working from the back. So let's go with the three methyl. Um, so we'll go one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, so three methyl, there's our methyl group. Uh, and a 3,4-diethyl. 
So that means there's two ethyl groups coming off of branches or uh, carbons three and four. Uh, so let's do one and two ethyl groups. Uh, yeah, and so here, that's our complete structure. And if we want to, uh, I guess, have a little bit of fun with it, we can like draw a torch on them, give them a little headband, some running shoes, uh, and now he's just going to be carrying the Olympic torch. But um, the molecule structurally is still correct. Okay, um, and finally, a bromochlorofluoromethane. So it's a methane, so there's just one carbon and everything else is going to be hanging off of that carbon. So why don't we start with drawing the hydrogen because we only have bromo, chloro, fluoro, um, three uh, uh, halides. Um, doesn't fill up all the spots for the carbon, so there's at least one hydrogen still remaining. Uh, and then we'll just draw the rest in as we go. So uh, bromo, chloro, fluoro. It doesn't define which position these are in, so if we did them in different positions, this would be just as uh, just as well. Um, but that does take us on to our next topic, um, because really, again, we know that these aren't all equivalent. There is going to be one that comes forward out of the page uh, and one that goes back into the page. And what happens if we do choose a different location for some of these. So if I draw exactly the same uh, molecule according to its name right there, so they'll have a bromine. Um, I'll just draw the branches here. Tick, tick, tick. Um, we'll keep, uh, let's keep the fluorine in the same place, but we'll switch out the hydrogen and the chlorine. Uh, so are these really equivalent? Uh, if we look at them back and forth, uh, could we make the second one exactly the same as the first one just by rotating it around in space is really the question. Are they exactly the same? Uh, so why don't we imagine kind of um, hanging that bromine by the ceiling and we'll allow these ones on the bottom to spin and rotate around, okay? Because the bromine and the chlorine are, are the the carbon are already in the same position, the right position. Let's just rotate that around that uh, carbon-bromine bond and see if we can get the rest into place. So, because uh, we want to get this hydrogen back up to where it was to begin with. And if we try that, I'll just redraw it. So we have the hydrogen in the same place now, but then following that hydrogen is a fluorine and the chlorine goes back to the back. Uh, so you can see that we don't have the same thing as what we started with. And these two can never be made the same just by rotating them around in space. So these are what's called optical isomers. Um, another word for this and, and the more common word is enantiomer. Uh, sorry about that. Let's try that again. Enantiomer. Uh, or optical isomers. These are mirror images of one another. And if you don't believe me, um, you could, uh, again, keep swinging these things around and you would end up with something that would be the mirror image of itself, okay? Um, which means that it can't, you can't just position them differently in space to get the same molecule back. So this is also what's called chirality. Uh, and so these molecules are chiral. Uh, for anything that's not superimposable on its mirror image. So if you want to think about this, and even where the root comes from, is your hands. So your hands are mirror images of one another. If we had, we make them real mirror images of each other, okay? So if we had, Oh, okay, so we have our two hands, and we can imagine a plane of symmetry going right down between them, eh? So I can't 
rearrange my hands so that you're seeing the palm of my hand and the thumb on the right hand side uh, without breaking off my thumb and putting it on the other side. So chiral molecules work the same way. Um, you would have to, in order to get the uh, carbon and the fluorine and the bromine and the hydrogen all around the same way again, you would have to break the bonds in that molecule and, and put it around in a different way. Uh, okay, so a chiral center for a carbon requires that it has four different groups attached to it. So it doesn't have that plane of symmetry, uh, rotational symmetry, um, but instead has, uh, has that kind of mirror symmetry to it. Um, why we call them optical isomers is because if you shine a uh, plane polarized light through a sample, um, one of the chiral molecules will rotate that light, the plane polarized light, one direction by a certain angle, and the other one will rotate it the other way by a certain angle. That's just something you find out experimentally. Um, you couldn't really predict it from the shape or from the, what the molecule is. Uh, or which way it's going to work for each. Um, but you can just tell if you have one and the other, they will do that. And of course, if you have a mix or a blend of both of them, then your plane polarized light will come out the same because it's going to average back and forth across your two different uh, enantiomers. Uh, okay, so if you want to look for uh, common examples of what this is, chemically speaking, um, the example that's usually out there is of thalidomide. So that was a, uh, a morning sickness treatment that was prescribed to mothers in the, the 60s and 50s um, in Canada, around the world, not in the United States because there, uh, there was a sharp-eyed FDA agent and she noticed that it, had only, uh, it hadn't been tested for the uh, chiral activity. Uh, and in fact, um, one of the hands, if you like, one of the um, enantiomers of thalidomide did in fact help with morning sickness. It was a perfectly safe drug to give to um, pregnant mothers. The other enantiomer caused severe birth defects. Uh, and there was a, uh, a number of children that were born uh, missing their arms as a result. So that's why it's not available any longer because it's just not safe uh, to use as a racemic mixture. So um, if the two enantiomers are mixed together, it's called, uh, let's see if my pen will work again, racemic. Um, and it's just not, uh, not um, easy to split them up or at this point marketable because what mother now wants to take thalidomide. Uh, another example that's really interesting is a molecule called carvone. Um, it looks like this. Okay, and we have a branch coming out forwards with a double bonded carbon and a single bonded carbon, and to the back is a hydrogen. Um, so this has a chiral center on it uh, right here. So going one way around this uh loop is going to look different than going the other way around the loop so and then obviously the, the two other th things attached to it are different so we can draw it again uh with now the hydrogen coming forward and to the back is going to be this double bonded carbon and single bonded carbon uh, and these are completely different so the first one i draw drew uh, provides the scent for spearmint. And the second one is the scent of rye bread uh, or caraway seed. Um, which, of course, if you've smelled mint and you've smelled rye bread, you know are quite different. It's exactly the same molecule, just uh, now they're optical isomers of each other. Uh, which also tells us that our olfactory senses, our nose, is capable of distinguishing between uh, chiral pairs. Okay, so that's that's it for today. We're going to carry on with alkenes on the next uh, video. Uh, so I hope to see you then. Thank you for watching.